Tonight on NJTV News, the Fed share of the multi-billion dollar gateway tunnel project may come through after all. A proposal to cut the funds fails in Congress. NJ Trans is buying high ground where they can store train cars ahead of major floods, but is the so-called safe haven necessary or even safe? Salvation Army New Jersey's emergency disaster services packing supplies and pitching in with personnel in cities hit hardest by hurricanes. The prospect of another Amazon headquarters in North America has New Jersey's Economic Development Authority salivating and pay off for raising the Bayonne Bridge. A huge container vessel has proved the port can handle 21st century traffic and deliver the goods. It's a really big boat. Those stories are more next on NJTV News. Major funding for NJTV News is provided in part by RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of New Jersey residents and businesses for more than 100 years. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Live from the Agnes Varis NJTV studio at 2 Gateway Center in Newark, this is NJTV News with Mary Alice Williams. Hello, thank you for joining us. Governor Christie and members of the state's congressional delegation met with President Trump at the White House this afternoon, topping the agenda, the Gateway Tunnel Project. The meeting comes a day after the House of Representatives effectively saved threatened funding for the new tunnel under the Hudson. Meantime, um, NJ Trance's board was voting on other ways to spend uh, state and federal funding. Brenda Flanagan reports. With Houston still drying out from Harvey and Irma roaring toward Florida, NJ Transit today unanimously voted to spend $185 million on property in Middlesex County where it can safely park its trains when catastrophic storms threaten, according to NJT's executive director. We need to relocate in the uh, event of a projected storm event similar to Sandy, so we need re to relocate trains out of the MMC. Uh, which trains were obviously flooded uh, back in Sandy at a, and at a pub open terminal. We need a place to store them. The MMC, or Meadowlands Maintenance Complex, is where NJT stashed more than 300 train cars that Sandy's storm surge flooded and ruined in 2012. Critics called it a bowl. Today they offered little praise for the new property, 25 acres on a freight line called the Delco Lead in New and North Brunswick. One transportation advocate called it flood prone. One, it's actually in a floodplain. Uh, they need something like 22,000 truckloads of fill to raise it up out of the floodplain. There shouldn't be any push. I mean, there's another three storms sitting down south of us right now, and we're all thinking about them. But Lackawanna Coalition Vice Chairman Steve Thorpe claims NJT's already got plenty of available track for storm storage located above flood prone regions. Marson Essex Line, third track between Milburn and Newark, and also Raritan Valley Line, that they could put plenty of equipment on. Mm -hmm. And other places, if they shut the system down, that are high and out of the way, that are protected, where they could keep equipment. Um, so this project basically is a luxury. New Jersey Transit hasn't got the bucks for luxuries. That even though the Federal Transit Administration's awarded a grant that covers almost half of the $368 million Delco lead project's price tag. Transportation advocates want NJT to spend its precious millions on a project they call far more important, both for commuters and the economy. Need another tunnel into New York and throwing money at a project like that, while it does have some merit, doesn't, doesn't rise to the level of what a tunnel does. The only benefits of this project of, of Delco Lead will be the, the benefits to the developers building this North Brunswick station. NJT's exec denied Delco Leads being built to benefit developers. He said it will create longer tracks to accommodate longer multi-level trains and will be flood-proofed against storm surge. We need a place that our facilities in and around that storage area that crews can report to uh, after the storm uh, so that we can inspect the trains uh, and then get those get them functional again for a uh, quicker return to service after a storm. The hurricane season may be heating up, but NJ Transit won't be able to use this new storage facility this season or the next. It's not slated to open until 2021. In Newark, I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJTV News.
A big pharma office is folding. Standing by at the Strategic Development Group studio at the NJCU School of Business is Rhonda Schaffler with the state's business news. Rhonda? Mary Alice, it's a blow for workers at Eli Lilly as the pharmaceutical company is shutting down its Bridgewater location and cutting staff. Eli Lilly will close the Somerset County Research and Development Office as part of its plans to eliminate 3,500 workers nationally. That's 9% of its workforce. Eli Lilly says the majority of the cuts will come through a voluntary early retirement program. The company did not state when the Bridgewater office will close or if the workers there will be offered positions at other offices. Eli Lilly says the moves are an effort to cut costs as it puts more focus on developing new medicines. Wayne Bay's Toys R Us is looking into what options are available to pay off millions of dollars in debt coming due. Published reports say one option is a bankruptcy filing. Media reports say Toys R Us has hired a law firm to review its options, which could also include refinancing that debt. The retailer reportedly has $400 million due by the end of the year. Toys R Us says it will provide its investors with an update later this month. The company's been struggling with falling sales. Amazon wants to open a second headquarters in North America and is asking interested cities and states to submit RFPs or requests for proposals. Amazon is already a major employer in New Jersey, and the state's Economic Development Authority today said, we are excited about this opportunity and look forward to reviewing the RFP, which was just released. Amazon says its new headquarters could include as many as 50,000 high-paying jobs. Retail investors who buy and sell stocks and other securities will now get their money a little bit faster. A new rule went into effect this week that requires financial transactions to close in two days. It used to take three days. We spoke with Dan Theek of the DTCC, an organization that processes trillions of dollars worth of financial transactions. He told us eliminating that one day helps protect investors from risk. As we saw in the financial crisis, um, things can change awfully quickly uh, as it pertains to the financial markets. Um, so time, in that sense, uh, just adds to the risk. In 2016, an average of over $270 billion in stocks traded every day U.S. markets were open. On Wall Street today, stocks closed mixed, the Dow down 22 points. And those are our top business stories. Day two of the federal corruption trial of Senator Bob Menendez. It started with opening statements on behalf of the co-defendant, Florida eye doctor Salomon Melgan. His attorney told, told jurors they won't find any evidence of corruption and that Melgan contributed to Menendez's campaign simply because he wanted his friend to win. Jurors also got to hear from the first witness, an FBI analyst who testified about emails related to Menendez's 2010 Paris hotel stay. Hurricane Irma is delivering death and destruction to the Caribbean with Florida now in harm's way, while Houston's been swamped and staggered by Hurricane Harvey's terrible force. When nature brings on the worst, it tends to bring out the best in people. Brianna Vernozzi reports on Salvation Army New Jersey's emergency disaster service team. Coming down. Teams at the Salvation Army New Jersey Division are moving quickly, packing up generators, loading emergency disaster supplies, and getting them ready to ship. Today, we caught up with the emergency disaster services crew as they prepare to send 250 hygiene and 60 cleanup kits at their headquarters in Union. These are items that are requested down south. Could be Florida, could be one of the U.S. Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, or Houston. Um, we're putting together the equipment that we had left over from Sandy from our latest disaster. Like dozens of other organizations, the Salvation Army is mobilizing hurricane relief efforts, first for the victims of Harvey, now Irma. This is your standard Salvation Army cleanup kit. A level mop with handle, a filter, for when they're in areas that might have mold or something like that, that could be harmful to them. Broom, 
some garbage bags. The Northeast Territory requested that extra supplies, especially for cleaning, be packaged and ready to go at a moment's notice. Michael Clayton tells us these simple items can make a huge impact. Anybody who's had their home damaged, they might have a little water damage, some, some soil has come in, some sand. Um, we'll give those out because locally in the stores uh, down south where the damage has been affected, they've been depleted of their cleaning supplies. So to help people to start to get their homes and their lives back in order, we'll supply these uh, items to them so they can begin to work on their own residence. Volunteers will roam the streets with these hygiene kits, toothpaste, soap, even areas that aren't hard hit are likely to be in need. Clayton says crews are being deployed all over the South to distribute meals and find victims searching for food. The Salvation Army has multiple types of mobile feeding units. There are canteens with equipment like stoves and ovens, canteens without, and feeding kitchens that are deployed during natural disasters. As of uh, yesterday, they've served the Salvation Army down in the south in the Houston area over 280,000 meals. Um, we have 95 mobile feeding units down there serving the public, and those numbers will only continue to grow as other disasters such as Irma affect the country. Governor Christie deployed roughly 100 National Guard soldiers to provide support in Florida in anticipation of Hurricane Irma. And New Jersey State Police led a convoy of five tractor trailers full of humanitarian aid to Houston. Most relief organizers tell us the best way you can help is through a financial donation to a reputable organization. The Salvation Army Eastern Pennsylvania Division is here now and they're loading up these supplies to get them out on cargo trucks and planes and deploy to the survivors of Hurricanes Harvey and Irma just as fast as they need them. In Union, Brianna Venosi, NJTV News. Just last year, Barnabas Health and Robert Wood Johnson University Health merged to create the largest integrated hospital system in the state. And now they're cutting the ribbon on a brand new hospital complex that has babies and their families at the heart of it. Leah Mishkin standing by in Livingston. Leah. Hi, Mary Alice. It's a very exciting evening here at the Medical Center. You can see a large crowd has gathered for this unveiling. A lot of people in this crowd are donors. And actually, um, RWJ Barnabas is actually an underwriter of NJTV News. But to explain to us a little bit more about this five-story new facility right here behind us. Look, they've cleared the path for us. Thank Steve, you. CEO, very nice to see you. Thank you yes. for having us. Thanks for being So on. tell us a little bit about this new facility. Well, thank you. Good afternoon. The Cooperman Family Pavilion is a brand new transformational building for St. Barnabas Medical Center. It's five stories, 241,000 square feet, and really the marquee showpiece is our neonatal intensive care unit. And we're so excited that the Coopermans have been so generous to allow us to uh, kickstart building this building with their donations. Right. Yeah, it was a $25 million donation, so a big donation. But for the patients, tell us a little bit about um, what this facility will bring to them. Sure, absolutely. This is a state-of-the-art facility allowing our patients to have all private rooms, which is uh, great for uh, quietness and privacy and an exemplar experience. Uh, we have a neurosurgical and orthopedics area, a medical oncology area, and general medical surgical areas. How exciting is this for you right now? Oh, it's fantastic. This is uh, such an energizing time for St. Barnabas Medical Center and for all the RWJ Barnabas Health System hospitals. Uh, it really is the centerpiece of energy for everything that we do here in our communities that we serve. And because of this, what, what will this provide to families? And have you, have you had any patients come up to you and are excited that this will be opening? Yes, absolutely. It provides our families with the latest ability and technology and uh, the ergonomics of the building. Uh, many people in the community are so excited, the, uh, the Livingston and Short Hills communities, that we have this asset that they can use as their resource. Any for you personally, I'm, I'm sure you've seen this from the ground up. So to be here tonight with this big crowd, uh, you're about to do this ribbon cutting. Yes. When you look out, what are you thinking of right now? Well, this is, this is a transformational step for the future of St. Barnabas Medical Center and all the patients that we serve in our communities. Great. Anything else you'd want to add or tell people watching tonight? Thank you all for being here. And St. Barnabas Medical Center represents a medical home for all those that want to access us. Thank you. All right, you. great. Thank you so much. We will Thank let you. you get to this ribbon great. cutting. Good luck Thank to you. you. So they will be cutting this ribbon, unveiling this new facility any minute now. Mary Alice, I will throw it back to you in the studio. Surpassing Princeton. That tops tonight's Garden State Express. Our first stop, Jersey City. 
with more members of the ACLU than any other in the state, replacing Princeton in the lead. Both cities are solidly democratic. The American Civil Liberties Union says at the end of July, 2,327 Jersey City households held ACLU memberships, 379 more than Princeton, whose population is a fraction of the size. Next to Pleasantville and free back-to-school haircuts, the Muslim Ecumenical Cognitive Community Action, or Mecca of Atlantic County, organized the event with the help of numerous sponsors, anonymous donors, and owner Roni Osias. He's been getting school kids shorn and shaped up for the start of school for five years. It's free to the first 150 students to arrive at his classic barbershop. Finally, Hazlitt, where township police didn't have to drive to this emergency, it drove to them. A frantic father-to-be told them his wife was in a car parked out front in labor. They jumped into action, helping mom deliver a brand new baby girl, permitting them a nice Facebook post and a new line on their resume, obstetrics. And that's our Garden State Express for Thursday, September 7th. Something up in your neighborhood? Tip us off. Cinephiles and film stars will converge on Newark this weekend for the second annual Newark International Film Festival, a three-day feast of film screenings, master classes, panels, and parties that could pump an infusion of cash into the brick city. Lindsay Christian sat down with the festival's founder, Kenneth Gifford. Kenneth, congratulations on your second Newark International Film Festival. I know which you founded. That's a big deal. Um, you've received over 800 film submissions from around the world, which is significant. That speaks to the fact that Newark is not only one of the top 10 cities in the nation for arts and culture, but it's the birthplace of film. Talk to me more about that. Oh, absolutely. So we got 826 submissions from 66 countries. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to Newark being the birthplace of film, you know, it was invented here in uh, 18, 1889 by Hannibal Goodwin. Uh, he was a priest on Broad Street and he wanted to find a way to make his Sunday school lessons a little bit more interesting, so he invented celluloid film. And a lot of people think it was Kodak Eastman that invented it, but it wasn't. He actually ended up suing Kodak Eastman and they won. Uh, 1900, he got $5 million towards copyright infringement. Unfortunately, he died December 31st, 1990, so he never got a chance to spend the money. Mm -hmm. But it gave validity to the fact that Newark is the birthplace of film. It's where it all started. That's a great history lesson there. So let's talk about the festival. Three days, jam-packed schedule. What can people expect? Oh, it's going to be absolutely amazing. We have a lot of celebrities. We have classes. Lamont Rucker from Greenleaf is teaching an acting class on Friday morning. We have the Tate brothers, Lorenz, Laron, and Lamar doing a Q&A a, uh, &A about the new face of independent Hollywood. Mm -hmm. We have Lance Gross. Eva Marcel is our ambassador. She'll be here all weekend uh, hanging out within the city and talking to people about her new projects and how to get into the business. So it's, it's going to be something absolutely amazing. And something for all ages. You also have a youth program, I understand, that will be running in conjunction with the festival. Absolutely. Our youth program starts on Saturday morning, and it will go up until about 6 o'clock Saturday evening. The interesting thing about the youth project is we have about 30 different youths coming from other countries to the city to be a part of that. But our youth program is part of our nonprofit foundation where we teach youth in something we call script to screen, mm -hmm. where we teach them how to write a project, how to produce it, how to edit it, and then shoot it all the way through. And then they get to submit it into the festival. I like that. So it's an educational component. Um, thousands are expected to attend this festival. I see dollar signs for the city <laughs> and the state. So talk to me about um, the magnitude of an event of this capacity, bringing in funds really to the city and state. So the film industry is a money machine. It's one of those industries that you definitely want in your city and your state. Um, hopefully we'll be able to get the tax credits back, but that's what it's geared towards. It's geared towards bringing that industry back to the city. And when you're talking about having 
uh, 800 some odd submissions coming from other countries. We're going to screen 123 films, which means all of those people are going to bring their family and their friends. They have to eat. They're going to want to shop. Each person who comes here will bring at least three people. And when you're out on a weekend town at a festival, you're spending at least $100 per person per meal. Wow. So you're talking about each person spending $400 on just the meals in the hotels, the air transportation, wow. cabs, it's a lot. So it's, it's good dollars. And the average festival can bring into a city $500,000 to a million dollars in revenue. I know um, the mayor will appreciate that for sure. I hope so. So I know the... <laughs> The festival will bring in a lot of profit, but you're flipping the script and you're actually offering a non, not for profit component um, in partnership with the Newark Office of Fil Film and Television. Talk to me more about that. Yes, yeah, so throughout the year, uh, what we do is we run the program where we're teaching residents and youth, local uh, residents, how to do filmmaking, how to get into the business. So we give them a training program, which is absolutely free. We do it all year long. We do it through the Center of Hopes with the mayor. We do it through the Office of Film and Television, Ironbound Studios, where they're allowed to come in, learn behind the scenes, hands-on cameras from Panasonic cameras. Um, we teach them everything from A to Z and give them a chance to get into the business. We had three individuals that came to Ironbound Studios about a year ago. They were all prisoner reentry. We taught them how to do the business, how to work the cameras, how to be PAs, and all three of them now are working on different projects in New York City and in Newark. So it's, it's just something that the city can be proud of, but it builds education, entertainment, and employment. There are a lot of benefits with the Newark International Film Festival, right? Community-based and helping, giving back, too. Tell us more about how we can find out about the festival and all of the events. I looked at the schedule, and it's pretty heavy. So it's definitely jam-packed. So you can go to the website, uh, www.norkiff.com, or you can download our official app, which is Nork IFF, all one word. And that will give you all the information you need to know about the festival, about ongoings, and all the projects and plans that are there. And again, it's year-round, so... Okay. It's going to be up, and you can come and join in the festival, join the programs, make it a great thing for the city. I'm really, we're excited about the film festival. I'm glad. Thanks for joining us, Kenneth. Thank you. New Jersey is a main artery for the nation's commerce. We began tonight with a report on upgrades to our rail infrastructure. We end with upgrades to a bridge that's ensuring our ports can remain competitive for the long haul. Michael Hill reports. The Theodore Roosevelt is carrying more than 14,000 containers, the most ever for a cargo vessel, to pass under the Bayonne Bridge, the bridge that was just raised 64 feet to accommodate bigger ships, ships that can carry up to 18,000 containers. It truly is an engineering marvel. This is the first time a project of this nature has ever been done, rebuilding a bridge while you're operating a bridge. Uh, you like to use the analogy, it's like performing open heart surgery on a runner as he's running his marathon. It's a modern day miracle. Along the way, the miracle had some bumps, noise complaints and more. The noise today, though, was the applause for the raised bridge and the Port Authority having dredged the shipping canal 50 feet so vessels like the Roosevelt could sail to ports in New Jersey and New York. The Roosevelt is making its maiden voyage to America's biggest East Coast ports. With all the hoopla and a big ceremony to mark this milestone of the raising of the Bayonne Bridge, what does it really mean in terms of dollars and cents and jobs for this area? That it's almost 400,000 jobs we're talking about. We're talking about $54 billion in economic um, gain in the in the region, over seven billion dollars in uh, taxes are going to be uh, between federal state income uh, are going to be accumulated. This is huge. This is a real game changer. And we have the, the wealthiest consumer market in the world, and uh, we're ready to serve it. We've spent billions of dollars uh, modernizing the port over the last 20 or so years, and we're ready to get to work. What is this vessel carrying? Oof, all sorts of things. Clothes, 
furniture, beer, and much more for a growing East Coast market. Literally tons of products made in Asia that sail on bigger and bigger boats through the widened Panama Canal. Is there a need for bigger and bigger container ships like this? Well, you know, uh, right now there's not that much growth in cargo. However, the, the more you can put on one vessel, the per unit cost goes down. So it's the economies of scales that makes the difference. But more goods on bigger boats could mean more trucks to and from the port and more pollution and more problems for those with respiratory issues. There's been a lot of investment by the Port Authority and, and uh, our terminal operators here in the port to um, develop on-dock rail services at all the terminals. So that'll get a lot of the trucks off the road. How is this more environmentally friendly than other ships that you have, smaller ships as you mentioned? Well, first of all, it's a brand new ship, so it's fitted with the latest uh, technology. Um, the engines are extremely efficient. Uh, they're powerful, but they, their level of emissions is very low. Low and already exceeding the standards of the International Maritime Organization, according to the Roosevelt's owner. What message are you sending with vessels like this in a port like this, in a state like this, in a region like this, to the rest of the industry? This is the place to come. Again, it's uh, the beginning of a great economic opportunity for the whole Northeast region that uh, New York and New Jersey are the prime beneficiaries of, but uh, it's, a, it's a great day. In Elizabeth, Michael Hill. NJTV News. Tomorrow on NJTV News, the new school year's biggest challenges. To share any story you've seen tonight, go to njtvnews.org. I'm Mary Alice Williams. For all the men and women of NJTV News, thanks for being here. See you tomorrow. Members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. And PSE&G, we make things work for communities.